assaulted? Are you armed and dangerous? Amen. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad. If you're miserable, tell nobody you're a Christian. Go home in a closet until you die and come back alive. Amen? <laughs> How many know God's on the move? Oh, big time. Things are happening. So many things that are happening, we can't even keep up. But I can tell you something right now, that there is a required assignment to the body of Christ. And that required assignment is to possess the land. Possess the land. We are in a time of possessing the land. The land is also known as territory. God has given everyone a part of a territory and a land, even where your family is, wherever it is. He's requiring us to do warfare to possess that land. In Acts chapter 17, if you'll go there, please. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of a, uh, asparagus. You remember that one? <laughs> Aeropagus. <laughs> yes, he's one of the veggie tales. And said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. <laughs> For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscri inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, him I'm going to proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Or as he worshipped with man's hand, men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries or lands and territories of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by the art of man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to what? Repent, because he has appointed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has also given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. Now, this is powerful because these boundaries and dwellings are the, are the lands and territories. They're also known as seats and positions of authority that have been lost to the enemy, which now God is restoring back to those who are called, who are covenant keepers, and walk in the anointing. Three things. Those who are called, who are covenant keepers, and they walk in the anointing. Why? Because they carry and express the divine nature. Without the anointing, you can't express the divine nature. So they are the called, the covenant keepers, and the anointed ones. They carry and express the divine nature. He has given this assignment to these individuals. In Matthew chapter 11. 11. Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there is, has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by what? Force. That means you, you can't be a wimp. You got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You got to know how to use the weapons of God. For all the prophets and all the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, 
He is Elijah who is to come. Now, did Elijah walk in the anointing? Amen. In fact, he carried the second mantle, didn't he? Whoa. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Again, before the land can be restored, the heavens must be taken. And this is where many people falter and fail. Because they try to fight first by what they see instead of what they don't see. The battle takes four first in the heavenlies. It's principalities, powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places. Amen? And that can only be done through the backing of the anointing of Christ Jesus. That's being filled with the Spirit of God. This is, where the, this is different between the letter and the Spirit. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2. 11, please. You know, even when you possess land, and, the, and people don't realize that everything, wherever it came from, has got something attached to it. You bought a new bicycle, you bought a new shirt, you bought this, you bought that, whatever it is. You bought a new car, you bought new shoes. Well, yeah, nice, you know. You know, when I was in Haiti, and uh, the children were making stuff and whatever. And everything they made, they brought a curse on. They prayed over it. And many other countries. I've been all many places, Cambodia and so forth. And they used the children. They paid them with sodas and candy bars and whatever. And they tell them to make this and speak a curse on it. Even music has a curse on it. They bring it into the called. Their, their organizations, the called organizations, and they pray over every album that's made, and they draw up demonic spirits and attach them to them so that wherever it goes, it can affect people. It's the same thing with material. Think about Adidas. That's a demonic force. Chipotle, that's a demonic force. All of these things that people don't realize. That's why the Lord said, bless everything that you eat. Amen? Why? What are you doing? You're breaking that curse off. Because what you eat is what you become. What you agree with, what you become. He says, come out from among them. Don't touch nothing unclean. Well, there's so many things that are unclean that people don't realize that they're bringing on their properties, they're bringing in their homes. And they've never considered to break the curse off of those things. That's called warfare, isn't it? Amen. Those are called accursed items. In fact, what did Jesus tell Joshua? He said, listen, you can't defeat your enemy until you remove those accursed items from your land. Amen? And when they did, they had victory. Because Joshua came back and said, man, you sent us out to go to war and we lost. What's up? Because you didn't remove the accursed item from your land. You cannot defeat your enemy. You will lose every battle. It doesn't mean you're not a bad person. Does everybody understand? It means that Satan's greatest weapon is deception. And he deceives people in sneaking things into their properties, into their lands, into their homes. And the next thing you know, boom. And you don't realize he doesn't just uh, do it that day. It's the process of time. Amen? So everything you get, even when we get stuff donated to us, we break off the curse in the name. Every day I break the curses off of everything that comes into our campus. Anything that comes into our personal homes. I break the curse off and I came in those spirits to leave those objects to go to the pit. And then I nullify their power by cleansing them with the blood of Jesus. This is warfare. Amen? So in this, hallelujah, we got to use wisdom. We are in a battle constantly. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Is everybody there? Therefore, remember, remember that you, are, you were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcised. Uncircumcised meant you had no covenant with God. By what is called a circumcision made in the flesh by hands. That at the time you were without Christ being alien, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. That's how we were. That's how many of the world is now. 
But now in Christ Jesus, who once, you once who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having established in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity between them both. Again, you and I were once uncircumcised without covenant, but now we have covenant. And, and this is something that people must know that you are a covenant-keeping child. If you are a covenant keeper, man, let me tell you, God is behind you. It's when people break covenant that he has to step back from it. Amen? And Deuteronomy 30, 15, please. You know, that's the move we're seeing right now globally. Amen? Remember, that's also seats and positions of authority political and so forth. They hold seats that hold lands. Those are possessions. God is beginning to expose them and drive them out. But it must be done through the body of Christ. Deuteronomy 30, 15, let's speak it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to what? Possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall, not prolong, you shall not prolong your days in the land which, which you cross over the Jordan to go and to possess. Now again, we know he's talking about Israel, but God speaks past, present, and future. We are the body of Christ now. When he speaks about Israel, he speaks about us. He's saying you can either choose life and goodness or death and evil, which is whether you live or eventually perish. Now, you know, when God says perish, it doesn't mean you're going to die that day. Amen? It's a process. <laughs> now, listen, that means that either you love God and obey, or you love yourself and rebel. Let's go to Hebrews 3, verse 7. Today, if you will hear his voice and do not harden your hearts as in rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray where? In their hearts. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if, that means cooperation, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. While well, it is said today, today if you hear his voice and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Wow. See, we are called. We are called with a covenant. We are called to pray. We are called to be humbled. God says if my people will humble, humble themselves and turn away from wickedness, then I'll heal their lands. Amen? Their lands. That means restore their lands. If they'll humble themselves, repent for doing anything rebellious, anything that was offensive to God, and turn away from this rebellion. Because see, rebellion, when God sees rebellion, he calls it wickedness. He will heal and restore. Again, when people turn their hearts away from the voice of God, their heart becomes hardened. He says, hear his voice. 
and you won't harden your heart. As in rebellion. Rebellion, rebellion is witchcraft, isn't it? Amen. We're seeing it all over the world. In Psalm 37, verse 12. The wicked plots against the just. Are you the just? That means that the enemy is trying to plan something against you every day. And gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at the wicked. For he sees that his day is coming. And I'm telling you, it's coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are of the upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart. What about the rebellious? They'll enter theirs. Their bow shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the what? The righteous, the wicked plots against the judge. What The wicked have no covenant with God. Or they have broken covenant. But the righteous have covenant. And Psalm 50, verse 16. But to the wicked, God says what? What right have you to declare my statutes? Or take my covenant in your mouth? What a rebuke. Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother or sister. You slander your own mother's children. These things you have done and I've kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. To him who offers praise and orders his conduct aright, upright. Many backslidden Christians are now a in a perpetual backslidden condition and are now called wicked because they have broken covenant and they don't even know it. In Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect converting the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. Those who are covenant keepers are warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Those are areas where people assume without seeking. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. And I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The fear of the Lord is clean. Judgments are true and righteous. Again, servants are warned in keeping them. There is a great reward to the covenant children of God Almighty. 2 Corinthians 3. It's time to stand up and fight. But you got to warfare first. You got to take down the principalities, powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places. Warfare, spiritual warfare must be done first before taking any land. You can drive out spirits from the land, but they'll come back. Because they're under authority under the principalities and powers of darkness. 
until you remove the powers of darkness and principalities and wickedness in heavenly places. They cannot be, the power, the de demonic spirits can't be removed from the land. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4. And again, I think this is where there's a lot of lack of understanding and discipleship in warfare globally in the body. There's a lot of love movements. There's a lot of all kinds of movements. But right now I'm telling you, God is in a warfare movement. He's in a driving out movement. Amen? Amen? And anything that's going to be in his way will be driven out. Verse 4, please. 2 Corinthians 3, 4. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the what? Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written in the graves and stones of, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because that glory of his co continence, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit be more, more glorious? For the ministry of, the, of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Much. So this new covenant is the ministry of breath of God. It's the ministry of the breath. The spirit means breath. It's not the ministry of the letter. It is the ministry of the Spirit, the presence of God. The breath of God, of His covenant people. When the, their words are spoken, they bring life and judgment. That's why confess, confession brings possession. If you are under that anointing, you are maintaining a covenant with God. The anointing is there with you. What you speak will not return void. But don't let unbelief or doubt come in because it will nullify it so it, before it can manifest. Does everybody understand? Because so many times we confess things. What you confess is you possess. And then you go into doubt just because it didn't happen that day or that week. I'm telling you it's coming. But you must trust, rest, and wait. And, and get out of the area of what you see. Amen? Yeah, well, my blood test says this, and this says that, and the doctor said this, and the landlord said this, and the insurance company said that, and who cares? It's what God says as the last word. Do you understand? So we've got to maintain. When we bring doubt and unbelief, we are nullifying God's last say. Amen? And we don't want to nullify. And sometimes we've we got to repent. Lord, forgive me. Have mercy upon me for bringing doubt into what I've spoken. You're faithful to complete what you started. Far be it how I should tell you how to do it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's got it. Amen. Amen.